Well, good morning, everyone. How are we this morning? I'm doing well. Football season is back. I love football. I love the University of Texas Longhorns, and so yesterday was a good day for me. But I also am a compassionate friend and know that I have many, many people who uh, follow the, the Texas Aggies and things didn't quite turn out uh, the way they should. So we grieve with them today, but we are gracious with them today because we haven't played them yet. And so I'm not going to count all my chickens before they hatch or whatever the saying is. I'm going to be gracious. Now, when we beat the Aggies, hopefully I get an opportunity to do the announcements or something like that. So we can bring, bring that to light. Um, my name is Clay. I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship Bible Church. I get to uh, come here every day and work with different ministries here at the church and, and see how we can all come together and kind of point in the same direction. Uh, I love getting to do that. And every once in a while, I get an opportunity to come up here and to speak to the congregation all at one time. And I also uh, enjoy doing that. It's a, it's a privilege. It's an honor and it's a great responsibility. And so again, thank each and every one of you for being here today. Uh, Pastor Alex is at home with his wife, Wendy. She had a, a surgery and is recovering well. She's doing fine, but he is making sure that she has what she needs. And so uh, just continue to pray for them as uh, they go through the recovery process together. And um, pray that Miss Wendy won't get too much of Pastor Alex, since he'll be spending quite a bit of time with her today. Now, uh, we spent the last few weeks in a series called Our House. We've been talking about how we as a, a group of believers uh, are, uh, we make up the church. The church isn't a building, but it's a group of us, and in that building, that, that, that church is our house, like a family unit. And what is, what is that look like for the church here uh, at Fellowship Bible Church in Longview? So the, the week one, uh, Pastor Alex talked about how our house would be a house where transformation happened where people could know that when they came here that God can, uh, can and does work in their lives and life change happens here. Um, and then the next week, CJ talked about discipleship. We're a house that values discipleship and how we can be about that and what that looks like here at FBC. And then last week, uh, Pastor Alex again talked about our house being a house of worship and what true worship looks like. And that was a pretty amazing thing to see. And so this week, we're going to continue on in that series, and I'm going to be talking about another priority or a pillar of our house, and that is evangelism. We want to be a house that places a priority on evangelism. So what does that look like? What is that even? And how do we go about that as a, as a, as a family, as a church body? Um, how do we go about being a house of evangelism? So if you brought your Bibles with you today, or you're taking notes, or if you've got your electronic device, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. If you didn't bring any of those things, it's totally cool. It'll be on the screen uh, behind you. Um, but that's where we're going to be kind of camping out today. In this passage of Scripture, we see a great example of one of the greatest evangelists of all time, uh, the Apostle Paul. It can probably be said that if it were not for the Apostle Paul, you and I wouldn't be sitting here today talking about Jesus. He literally took the good news of the gospel to, um, to the world, all the way down into Turkey. Uh, he, he went everywhere. And so um, he kind of had a, a handle on evangelism. So we're going to look at uh, some of the things that he talked about. But first, I think it's important for us to define what evangelism is, and more importantly, what it is not. Uh, a lot of people, if we don't get an accurate view of what evangelism is, and uh, we don't get that nailed down, we tend to spend too much time focusing on what it isn't. Uh, we call, when we call things, when we call evangelism things they aren't, uh, we place too much emphasis um, on our own importance in the conversion process. So it's really important that we know what evangelism is and what evangelism is not. So um, we as a body need to know what we're talking about. We need to be crystal clear when we say things like evangelism or conversion or the gospel. We need to have that nailed down before we go um, and share others. And so according to the Oxford English Dictionary, evangelism is the spreading of the Christian gospel by public preaching or personal witness. So that's what evangelism is. The gospel, the gospel message answers four questions. Who is God? Why are we in such a mess? What did Jesus do? And how can we get back to God? We're going to touch on that a whole lot more here in just a little bit, so we'll, we'll come back to that. And then conversion is a person turning away from sin in themselves to Christ in faith 
in trusting in Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Now, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is not the work of us. Conversion is not evangelism. If you'll notice that uh, the definition of, of evangelism does not require an immediate outward response. That's not what it says. So walking down the aisle or raising your hand or reciting a prayer, uh, that can mean that evangelism has occurred, but such results are not what evangelism is. Evangelism is us being faithful to share the message of the gospel to others, be that by preaching, like I am now, or by proclaiming it in your daily life to the people around you in your life. That's what evangelism is. Evangelism is merely us being obedient. It's the result of us being obedient to share the good news of Jesus with those around us. And you say, why does, it, why does it matter, Pastor Clay? Like, why is evangelism such a big deal? It makes me uncomfortable. I don't enjoy doing it. I don't know how to do it. Check out some of these statistics from the, the Barna group that were done just a few years ago. 73% of Christians surveyed believed that it was their responsibility to share their faith. So 73% of people think, yes, since I'm a Christian, it is my responsibility to share my faith. But of that 72%, only 52% of them had actually shared their faith with at least one person during the previous year. That's not going out and, and, and holding crusades and, uh, you know, you didn't lead hundreds of people to Christ. That's you didn't share it with one single person all year long, over half of Christians today. Evangelism is important. We were commanded by Jesus to do it. It's one of the main reasons. It is the main reason we're here is to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus with others. Only half of us are doing it. Something that's a little more sobering. Millennial Christians, no more unbelievers, that's close friends or family members, than older generations in the past. Almost every single one of them believes that sharing the gospel is part of their Christian faith. So 96% of millennials believe that it is their responsibility to share their faith. But check this out. 47%, almost half, believe that it's wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone that has different ones in the hopes that they will come to your faith. So let that sink in for just a minute. 47% of an entire generation thinks that it's wrong to share their faith with others of a different faith in hopes that they will come to their faith. Half of us think that that's wrong. Evangelism is important. It's critical that we at FBC are a house that is rock solid when it comes to evangelism. The Apostle Paul is a great example for us to look at, like we talked about earlier, when we seek to, to learn how we're going to be a house that preaches, teaches, and lives out evangelism. So let's start out by reading 1 Corinthians 9, uh, verses 19 through 23. Paul is talking to the church here. Um, they've had some issues. They've had some infighting. Um, they're, they're doing a whole lot. Of, they're not getting a whole lot right. And Paul is writing to them um, and, and telling them uh, and addressing a whole bunch of issues. But here's where he's talking about reaching people with the gospel message. He says, although I am free from all and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law, though my, I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law, though I'm not without God's law, but under the law of Christ, to win those without the law. To the weak I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I may be by every possible means save some. Now I do all of this because of the gospel so that I might share in its blessings. So Paul is saying here, I'm becoming all things to all people so that I might save some. It's a big deal to Paul. And so we see here that we are to be tools that the Lord uses to share his message. God could have chosen other methods to share the gospel, and I guarantee you they would have been more effective. Can you imagine an angel showing up to you and telling you the message of Jesus and asking you to respond? It would be a lot easier to it would be a lot harder to say no to that than it would be to Pastor Clay uh, sharing his story about Jesus. Um, but God chose saved people to share the message with lost people. And this passage of Scripture shows that there's a goal that we need to own as followers of Jesus, and there's a message that we have to share. There's no way around it. 
And that goal that we must own, you can see in verses 22 and 23, where Paul says, I have become all things to all people so that I might be uh, by every possible means save some. Save some. Now, it's important to note here that Paul isn't saving anyone. When Paul says that I might save some, he's talking about leading some to Christ, leading others to Jesus. He is not taking credit uh, for anything to do with anyone's salvation. He is merely a vessel that is used by Jesus and the Holy Spirit to get that done. But that is his goal, is that he could do everything possible, that he could just save some. So is that our goal? Is that your goal this morning? Awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. But maybe you're wondering, should that be my goal? Isn't that the church's job? Doesn't a missionary take care of that or somebody gifted in evangelism? Like, that's not for me. But if we look in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus says uh, he came to seek and save the lost. And we're supposed to be like Jesus. So yes, that should be our goal, to tell other people about Jesus. And Paul says uh, at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in the very beginning of, of chapter 11, that just as I also try to please everyone in everything, not seeking my own benefit, but the benefit of many so that they may be saved. Imitate me, so as I also imitate Christ. We see again, Paul is saying, do what I do. I'm doing what I need to do so I can share Jesus with others. So yes, it very well, it, it very surely should be our goal. Evangelism should be our goal. I hear it said all the time, though, that evangelism just isn't my gifting. Like I'm not any good at it. I don't know what I'm doing. It makes me nervous. It's awkward. Uh, the longer we go in society, the less acceptable it is to share your faith. And so it's awkward. I don't like it. I've never met a new grandparent that struggled to talk about their new grandchild. I've never seen a newly engaged woman who didn't want to show off her new wedding ring. We share about what we care about. And if we care about people, if we care first about serving Jesus, then evangelism should be something that we all do. So, again, I think it's important to note that as we go into this scripture, Paul talks about saving people. It's important to know that Paul isn't saving anyone. And that's not what I'm saying that we're doing. We're not saving anyone. That's the realm of the Holy Spirit. What we're called to do is to share the message faithfully and obediently. And can we do that clearly in a way that uh, honors Jesus? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. That goal that we have, that we can by any means necessary save some or lead others to Christ. That's a realistic goal. Even Paul, gifted as he was, did not think that he would be able to lead every single person to Christ. He knew that he wouldn't be able to do it. But he did aim to save some and those some would lead others, and then those others would lead others. Paul knew that there would be some that would reject the message. He knew that. He knew that they would reject the good news that he was bringing to the world, but his goal was to save some. This helps keep us from feeling overwhelmed, right? When we think about the vast number of people that don't know Jesus, if we think about the, the current social climate, the political climate, it can be overwhelming to share Jesus with one person. That's okay to feel like that. We don't have to share Jesus and lead everyone to Christ. We have to be faithful and obedient, and our goal should be to leave some. I can't possibly lead every single person in Longview, Texas to Jesus. I would love to. I would love to. I would love to be an instrument used to do that. But I'm not going to be able to do that, and that's okay. We need to keep our goal realistic and know that it's okay. Even Paul himself, his goal was to save some, to lead some to Jesus. But we need to begin praying now that you would come into contact with people that don't know Jesus. Pray that God would put people in your path that need to hear that gospel message and that you would be obedient to share it when those opportunities come up. Pray for opportunities to share the gospel with people in your life. And it doesn't have to be a complete stranger that you walk up to off on the street. That's weird. I'm not telling you to do that. If somebody came up to me that I had no relationship with and was like, do you know if you die tonight where you would spend eternity? I would go, yes, but this is awkward. How about hello? 
right? Let's start with hello. We don't have to get crazy with it. But I guarantee you there's somebody in your family, and if there's not, praise God, but I bet there's somebody in your family that doesn't know Jesus. I bet you there's somebody that you're connected to at work or at home uh, that, that is going through hurt that doesn't have anywhere to turn, and you have an answer. You have the answer. You, you can point people to Jesus. That's what we're talking about. That's what we need to be about as a house is evangelism, sharing that message with others. It's crucial. This goal is crucial. What is more important or crucial than leading people to Jesus? I'll wait. Nothing. If a person is not saved, they're lost. Those are the only two choices. And we're not talking about saving someone uh, from a temporary situation here. We're talking about eternity. And if we believe in the Bible and we follow Jesus, we cannot escape the fact that an eternal hell awaits them and it's an awful place. There's no way around it. Jesus described it as a place of unquenchable fire where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's awful. You'll be thirsty and you can't be quenched. It talks about your skin like it's, it's an awful place. It's a real place, and Jesus spoke about it, actually more than he spoke about heaven. It's important. Evangelism is important. So when we talk about getting saved, we're not talking about people getting saved from, from low self-esteem or, or a life of failure. They're getting saved from God's eternal wrath and judgment on the sin in their life. It's a crucial goal. It's a real goal. There is grace. Jesus came. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But before anything, God is holy, God is just, and God is righteous. And if you sin, there is a punishment for that sin. You deserve it. It's easy to forget that. But if you don't follow Jesus... The wages of sin is death. We're not talking about just a physical death. We're talking about spiritual death where you will spend eternity in hell. There's no way out of that on your own. It's a crucial, crucial goal for us to be a house that places a high priority on evangelism. And it's a compelling goal. Because it's so crucial... The goal of leading some, saving some, has got to take a priority in our lives, and it's got to take priority in our house as a church. Verses 19 through 23, if you'll look back through these, they scream Paul's passion for the lost. In verse 19, it's to win as many as possible. In verse 20, it's to win the Jews. On in verse 20, it's to win those under the law. And then he goes on, to win those not having the law, to win the weak. By all means possible, save some. Paul's talking about every single person he comes into contact with. All of them are important. I got to do everything in my power that I can do just to point them to Jesus. That's the point. That's the goal. It's compelling. Now, I know if this weren't the Apostle Paul, and we're not talking about inspired scripture, there's probably some people in here that would say, hey, and they'd be theologically correct like Paul. Don't you know you can't save anyone? Only God can save people. And if God has chosen to save them, he'll do that without your help. Paul realized, and we should too, that the sovereign God of the universe can and will use whatever means he chooses to save his elect. He sees fit to use men and women who are compelled by the goal of saving some. That should be our goal. So, we see in this scripture that there's a goal, and then there's also a message that we must proclaim, and that message is the gospel. It's true. Clay can't save anyone. You can't save anyone. That's the Holy Spirit. But scripture says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. There is saving power in the gospel. What Jesus did is the greatest thing to happen for mankind forever and forever. There will never be anything greater. So to share the gospel, what does that mean? It does not mean that you are required to become a clever salesman. It doesn't mean that you're required to become a deep theologian. 
It just means that you understand the gospel clearly so that you can present it effectively. That's all it is. And we talked about earlier, the, the gospel message covers four points. Number one, who is God? We talked about this a little bit earlier. God is the creator of the universe. There is nothing before him, and he'll, he'll last forever. He saw fit to, to create this planet and all the things in it. And he created man, and he wanted a relationship with his creation, with man. And so he did that. He created Adam, and he created Eve, and everything was wonderful. There was a tree in the Garden of Eden. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, you can do anything you want. You can have anything you want. Stay away from this tree. If you touch this tree, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. That was the only rule. Everything was great. Adam and Eve could not do it. They went and ate from the tree, and that is where sin entered creation. And because of that, there is a divide. There's a wedge driven between God and man. And this, this wedge, this divide is so great that we can't get back to God on our own. We are separated from him. And it talks about in scripture, the wages of sin is death. When we die because of sin entering into creation, we spend eternity in hell separated from God. There's nothing that we can do to fix that. It's because we're born into a sin nature, and that's the way it is. There has to be a penalty paid for sin. Everybody sins, so everybody deserves judgment. That's an awful story. It's a sad story. It's bleak if that were the end of the story. But Jesus, what did Jesus do? Jesus came. Jesus is God. He came into creation in the form of human. He was fully human and fully man, and he lived a perfect and sinless life. He offered his life as a substitution, as an atonement for our sins. He was crucified on a cross, hung there. He died, was buried, and then three days later, he rose again. And now then, he sits at the right hand of God the Father. But because of that sacrifice, we have hope. All that we have to do is to place our hope and faith in Jesus, admit that we're a sinner and that we need his saving grace, and then choose to follow a life that lead, uh, that, that, that lead a life that follows after him. And scripture says, if we believe with our hearts and we confess with our mouths, we will be saved. It's not about anything you do, for it is by grace you have been saved, not by works, lest any man should boast. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can say. There's no way that you could be to get you closer to God. Only Jesus only the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross brings us closer, fills that void, crosses that gap. And all you have to do is place your faith in Jesus. And when that happens, nothing can take that away. Jesus will never leave you. Jesus will never forsake you. Jesus will never turn his back on you. You can't do anything bad enough to make Jesus not love you. Ever. That's the gospel. It's a long version. An easy version at the grocery store or at small group is, this is my life before Jesus. Now this is my life after Jesus. That's it. And then walk with people. Talk with people. Explain people how you feel, how Jesus has changed your life, how the Holy Spirit has worked through you and in your family, and how things are better, because I guarantee you, they are. I have never once Heard anyone say, I gave my life to Jesus and everything was worse. Does that mean it will be easy? Absolutely not. The Bible is clear that we will have trials. We will suffer, but we have hope. This is temporary. Because of the gospel, we have hope. No matter what, someday we will spend eternity with Jesus forever. Forever. And there are people in your lives that don't know that. There are people in this room probably that don't know that. We should be a body, a home, a house that places a priority on sharing the gospel of Jesus. Now winning people to Christ or leading people to Jesus requires us presenting the gospel to lost people without needlessly offending them. 
And now I understand that this could be a hot button topic. We talk about being offended. Everybody's offended about every little thing. But what I'm talking about is extremely important. If you look back at verse 19, Paul says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Paul's talking to believers here, not to lost people. He's saying, I have made myself like a slave. A slave does not view themselves as being over others, but rather under them. That's how a slave works. They don't think of themselves first, but of those they serve. So Paul made himself a slave to those who were without Jesus. If Paul did that, it's a safe bet that we should do that. So do you view the lost as an enemy to be fought or those you need to serve? It's easy to talk about loving lost people when we're sitting here on a Sunday morning, but you run into that guy at Walmart who's ripping you a new one for walking in front of him. Now, he doesn't know Jesus. Is he your enemy that needs to be fought or somebody that you need to pray for and to serve? How are you serving them? How are we serving those people in our lives on a daily basis? Do you look for opportunities to serve your neighbors or your lost family members? Are you looking for ways to reach out and connect and to to point them to Jesus? Like CJ said earlier, intentionality in the way we live. Are we looking for opportunities to be able to do that? If an unbeliever is rude to you, do you react with anger? Some sign language? Or with kindness? You're on it. We're on the same page today. It's incredibly important what Paul is trying to get across here. Where is this person at? Where are these people at that we're trying to reach with the gospel message? Paul had one message. That's it. It was, it was, it was a gospel message. Now, the message never, ever changed. Paul never, ever, ever changed the gospel message to suit people he was speaking to. Never. But culturally, he considered the perspective of the people that he was sharing the message with, right? He wanted to think like they did. He wanted to act like they did as long as it wasn't sinful so that they would hear the message of Jesus. In verse 20, it says, to the Jews, Paul became a Jew. Wasn't Paul already a Jew? Yes. But he had left that cultural aspect of Judaism, right? When God called him to preach and share the message with Gentiles, people that were not Jews, Uh, So when he went back to Jerusalem where he hung out with Jewish people ever, he kind of had to relate to them as a Jew. So in modern terms, with the Jews, Paul was kosher, right? At breakfast, he didn't eat bacon with these guys. Paul knew, he read the room, uh, uh, who is with. To those under the law in verse 20 is another way of looking at the Jews, right? It focuses on their religious practices, especially keeping these, these ceremonial aspects of the law. Paul wasn't under the law like that anymore. Now, the moral law, yes, of course, but he says, I'm under the law of Christ. And what he's talking about here, Jesus said, you know, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul is under the law, yes, but he's not under Jewish law. But he became like that so he could relate to people, so he could share the news of Jesus with them. Those without the law in verse 21 refers to the Gentiles. Those are the people that don't have the law of Moses, that don't live by that. When Paul was with them, he could lay aside uh, non-moral aspects of the law of Moses and live culturally like a Gentile. He could live the way they live. Paul's not saying here, though, that anything goes. Paul is not saying do whatever you need to do so you can point people to Jesus. That's not what we do. Uh, He states that he's under the law of Christ. right? So so he's not going to... um, He's not going to go back on his principles on what Jesus is teaching or how he calls us to live. He's not going to sin so he can lead people to Jesus. So when you see people, uh, it's, it's kind of getting popular in, 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 uh, in, in our time now in culture. Like, I'm just going to act completely like the world, and I'm going to ingratiate myself with them, and then I'm going to show them Jesus. That's not how it works. Typically, you're going to end up being pointed and pulled their direction, not you pointing and pulling them to yours. And it's important that we keep that in mind. Paul is stating here that he's under the the law of Christ, and the gospel method can change. We see here through all these things, Paul was totally cool with changing the way he reached people, but the gospel message remains the same. 
we don't change the gospel message to make it more palatable to others. We don't change the gospel message so that we won't offend others. The gospel message may very well offend people. And that's going to happen. But we don't change the message. We can change the method. Paul's overall point here is that we need to understand where a person's at. And we need to not do things with our behavior to needlessly offend them. The message of the cross, like I said, may offend them, but we don't need that to be our behavior that does that. Don't make non-gospel issues the issue. Make the gospel the issue. There are times and there are places for those arguments. Again, not anything goes. But when we are tasked with sharing the gospel with someone who does not believe or who has not heard, the gospel issue is the main issue. All of these other things we can talk about later. We don't need to offend people from the get-go. We need to meet them where they're at, build a relationship, so then we can share that message um, and, and let the Holy Spirit move and the Holy Spirit work. That's what it comes down to. This passage of Scripture convicts me in so many different areas. I lack Paul's all-consuming passion to, by all means, just save some. I can't stand here today and look at you in the eye and honestly say to you that I do all things for the sake of the gospel. I'm too isolated from lost people to reach them with the gospel. With the gospel. It's just a fact. I work at a church. A lot of my friends are church people, and it's hard sometimes to make those connections. I'm just being completely honest with you. That's why I say also, um, people look at me as a pastor and think that I should be doing all the evangelism. You guys have more impact and reach than I do. You guys are around so many different people in your sphere of influence and in your lives that I could never reach. I see them if they come to the church or if we do an event, but outside of that, I don't have a whole lot of connection. Maybe you're convicted the same way. Maybe you aren't connected enough to lost people to, to lead them. Or maybe you, um, you act too much like worldly people for someone to even see a difference. Maybe you're not in a position that you could share the gospel because you've, you've put yourself in a position and you've kind of, you've just put yourself in a position that you're not able to share the gospel as freely as you should be because of the way you've chosen to live. However, however the Lord speaks to you, I urge you to wrestle with what God's saying. And I ask that you, you ask God to change your heart, to provide you opportunities, and just to help you to remember to live intentionally, to see everything through that gospel lens. If it's going to the post office, if it's headed to Walmart, if it's sharing Sunday dinner, that we're looking at every situation through a gospel lens. And then how can we as a, a family, how can our house be a house that preaches evangelism, right? Shouldn't be the only thing, we, the, shouldn't be the main thing we preach about here. This is for edification. Evangelism happens out there. How can we be a body of believers that preaches it, that we teach it, but then more importantly, we live it out? When everyone walks out these doors today, they are coming into contact with people and they are living in such a way that they are able to share the gospel of Jesus with the people around them. How can we do that? We just need to pray that God would fill us, that God would move, and that God would enable us to keep that at the front of our minds as we go throughout our day and as we go throughout our week this week. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, first and foremost, we thank you for who you are. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, and we thank you that he came and he, he died on the cross so that we could be in relationship with you. Father, I pray that as a house here at Fellowship Bible Church, we would be a house that, that puts priority on evangelism, God, that we seek to follow you more than anything, and that above everything, that you would get all the honor, glory, and praise. Father, fill us and fuel us so that we may, by any means necessary, just lead as many people to you as we can. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so this morning, if the band would go ahead and, and, and head up here, we're going to come into a, a time of communion. I know the, the, the order of service has been crazy 
these past few weeks, and we changed it, and now that it's kind of looking different, we're going to go back to normal. But this is uh, uh, our, our, our week for communion. And so at FBC, we have a, a, a rhythm of receiving communion on the first Sunday of the month. So as the servers are preparing the elements and coming forward, I want to give you just a, a brief introduction on communion. Uh, remember that our cups, we have the, the juice and the bread, they're, they're kind of stacked together, so you only need to take one when the tray comes by. Um, once you receive the elements, if you'll hold on to them, uh, we'll all take them together. And so if you need gluten-free elements, uh, just raise your hand and they'll, they'll make sure that you get those. At Fellowship Bible Church, we practice what is known as open communion, which means that elements are available to all who profess a, a Christian faith and believe in the Lord Jesus as Savior not just those who belong to our congregation. So if you're a believer in Jesus and you've placed your faith in him, we welcome you and ask you to join us at the communion table. And then if you're here today and you don't believe in Jesus, we're glad that you're here. It takes a lot of courage to come somewhere to listen to people talk about some things that you don't necessarily believe in. It takes a lot of courage. So we're glad you're here. We just simply ask that you let the elements pass and, and on to your neighbor. We're not gonna judge you. Our sincere hope and prayer is that you would come to know Jesus. And so at the very most, uh, we would just pray for you. We are not here to judge you. So with that instruction, let's now prepare our hearts to receive communion as a body. So in doing so, let us remember the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, when he said, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So as we pass the elements and as the musician plays, let's take a moment for self-examination and reflection this morning.
I invite you to this table in the name of the one who said, I am the bread of life. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is here that we remember how he gave his body and his blood to save us. So on the night of his betrayal, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you again this morning just thanking you, Father, thanking you for your son, thanking you for the awesome gift of grace and redemption. We thank you for the opportunity that we've had to come together this morning and to share your word, Father, and to come together as believers. And we pray that we would live in such a way that honors you. Father, I pray that you would keep us all safe and that we would be ambassadors for you with all those we come into contact with. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So in this part of our service is a time where we get to respond to God in worship. We're going to continue uh, with another song of worship. If you've got something in your life that you need to give to Jesus, now is a great time to respond to that. The altar is open. If you need to come and pray, then come and do that. We will have people down here that are willing and able to pray with you. If you've got something going on or something you need someone to pray with you for, we would love to come alongside you and do that. So if you guys will stand, we're going to continue with an opportunity to respond today in worship.